Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lit Up Lightworker podcast, bringing you fun and soulful interviews with spiritual teachers with the aim of tuning you in and lighting you up. You can access all episodes of the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn. And be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos and interviews all about finding and following your life purpose. My name is George Lizos. I'm a spiritual teacher, intuitive, the author of Be the Guru and the number one best selling Lightworkers Gotta Work. And today I have with me Amanda Yates Garcia, the Oracle of LA. Amanda Yates Garcia is a writer, witch, and the Oracle of Los Angeles. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the LA Times, the SF Chronicle, the London Times, the Millions, the Believer, CNN, Salon, Bust. Bravo, as well as a viral appearance on Tiger Carlson Tonight. Host of the popular Between the Worlds podcast, her first book, Initiated, Memoir of a Witch, came out in October 2019 and has been translated into six languages. Amanda, welcome to the Lit Up Liveworker podcast. It is my great delight to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. I am so excited to have you here to chat all about being a witch and how we can um, stand, step into our power of being a witch to create change in the world and to work our magic, quite literally. But before we get there, I want to go back to your story. What has been your story to doing this work in the first place? You mean like, how did I come to this? Yes, work? exactly. Well, so. I was brought up practicing witchcraft. My mother is a witch and I was initiated into her tradition uh, around my 13th birthday. So we come from the West Coast tradition of reclaiming, which is kind of a loose, I guess, confederation of groups. Um, and, that, and that practice really draws from many different traditions such as the fairy tradition and also Wicca and um, you know feminist liberation theologies and things like that. Um, California is well known as a place for um, quote unquote alternative religions, and it had been growing in the West Coast for a long time. But as I describe in my book, initiated, you know, even though I was initiated as a witch as a young woman, it, it was really life that initiated me. You know, I, I speak in my book a lot about you know underworld journeys and how these underworld journeys initiate us. In other words, it's really the challenges that we go through in life that show us what our true gifts are. And once we make it through those challenges, you know, we find our way out of the underworld. Often we're dragged there against our will. You know, we're we're brought into our challenges. Um, not voluntarily and yet we're kind of taken down there in the dark and we have to feel and find our way out but then once we do we know the way and we can help light the way carry the torch for other people who might be lost because while i was down there i was inspired by mythological figures artists poets um other witches and they really helped me find my way out so I feel like it was really an evolving process and also I'm still learning, you know, I'm always going deeper. I love how liberating your approach to witchcraft is because it sort of makes it universal because I know there are so many different types of witchcraft. When I was first starting out in spirituality, I meddled with like different types as well, like traditional witchcraft, then it was Wicca, then Christian witchcraft of all of all things, um, and there there is a lot of um, dogma sometimes around witchcraft, and the way you talk about it is very much like grounded into the earth and focused on our own personal experiences, which I love. Which also brings me to the question: What is a witch from your perspective? Because I've spoken with a few people who practice witchcraft, and every single person gives me a different flavor of it, which I feel like it's all true and it's all real and it's all like I create representations, but let's expand the conversation further. So from your perspective, what does being a witch mean? Well, so yes, I can't speak for everyone because as you said, everybody does have their own idea of what witchcraft is. Uh, witchcraft is not an organized religion, right? It's, some, it's a mystical tradition and mystical traditions 
are traditions wherein you have your own direct relationship with the divine. It's not something that's passed down through a pope or through a doctrine or through the Bible. You know, it's something that you, that you develop your own relationship to. However, I can say that for me in my own practice, there are a bunch of different things that I feel like qualify as a witch. So first of all, a witch recognizes and honors the sacred in nature. Witchcraft is a, a religion of nature. It's a, tr it's a mystical tradition that honors the spirit of nature. She also, or they or he, also honors themselves as part of nature. So they don't see nature as something separate from them, but they see something nature as something that they are part of, and in fact, a steward of, right? So they're honoring it, they're supporting it, they're, they're working with it in, um, in a sacred relationship. Also, a witch is a co-creator with the anima mundi, with the spirit of the world, with the spirit of nature, with the spirit of earth. So witches don't see themselves as subjects of the deity. They don't see themselves as at the mercy of the deity, but they see themselves as working in co-creation, as in, as empowered relation, in, in empowered relationship to, to deity or to the spirit of the world. They also are actively working towards justice for all beings, especially those who have been most impacted by capitalist and colonialist violence. So that's an essential part of witchcraft as I see it. Um, witches take responsibility for their own power. Unlike many organized uh, religious tradi traditions where we're kind of always handing our power over to the authority figure, the witch takes responsibility for her own power and her own agency and for for developing that and for working with that. But she also shares her power. It's not something that she hoards to herself, but it's something that she shares and co-creates with her, her community. So she works in a way that is, um, well, there's a, a term for it called horizontal leadership, where we recognize that everybody is bringing their gifts, everybody is bringing their voice. And we really have to, if we're going to survive and thrive, uh, as beings on this planet, we really have to honor the voice of every single creature on this earth. Uh, I've got a lot more things to say about this, actually. So um, she's someone who practices magic using symbols and rituals and working with deities and sacred objects and offerings. I mean, to be a witch, you practice witchcraft. That's kind of a, wow. fundamental, <laughs> a fundamental principle, which is also usually practice divination with runes or tarot or pendulums or other oracular methods. They have animal familiars, so they're connecting with um, the animal realms and the ancestral realms and other spirit realms. They're working with the seasons of the earth and the astrological seasons. And most importantly, Fundamental to my practice and my vision of what witchcraft is, the witch is on a mission to re-enchant the world, which is um, a, a phrase that many witches will remember from Sylvia, Sylvia Federici's work. She wrote a book called um, Caliban and the Witch and also uh, a book about re-enchanting the world, but she's taking that term from Max Weber, who was um, a German, a philosopher, sociologist, who wrote a book called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. But basically the idea is that capitalism essentially makes everything on earth into an object that is available to be exploited uh, for profit. Mm. And, and the witch is anti-disenchantment. So she actively works to re-enchant the world and make it sacred again through her actions, through her deeds, and through her practices. Oh, wow. I love this definition. And just thinking about it from my Greek pagan perspective, it's a way of like taking though that pagan uh, religion of being connected to the earth and applying it in a more active way to just create stuff rather than just honoring. So it feels like um, they're kind of sisters, witchcraft and paganism in some way. Um, I love that you touched on colonialism. My, my degree, my first degree was in geography. So I studied a lot about colonial and post-colonial geographies. And that's when the term cultural appropriation came into uh, realization. And I first realized, oh my God, 
I've been doing that <laughs> with like, my, my new age practices. And that's when I realized how important it is to respect the different cultures and not to take things for granted. And also to uh, the value of connection with the spirituality of my own land. Because uh, right when I was having a transitioning point in my spirituality, I, I got called to connect with the goddess. And I got into the Celtic goddess temple in Glastonbury and I had a chat with the priestess there. And although I, I was fascinated by the Celtic goddesses, I realized, you know what? I'm not a Celt. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Greek Cypriot merman. Why would I mess with the Celtic gods and goddesses? Why not go with the Greek religion? And it was only when I got uh, ordained as a Greek pagan priest, it felt like coming home and it felt like letting go of um, a breath I hadn't known I'd been holding in because it just had this core connected to that. So brings me to the question, do you feel that we should or we could or it would be nicer if we chose to practice witchcraft that's more connected to our own land and to the pagan tradition or the witchcraft tradition or our own land? Or is it okay if we combine different paths or if we go with a path that feels right for us? Where do you stand on this and how do we navigate this? That is such a great question. You know, actually my next book is, is about that. That's what I'm working on right now because in fact, it's such a complicated issue. For, for instance, for me, I'm a seventh generation Californian. My, my family has been in California since before it became a state. However, I am not indigenous to this land. You know, in fact, my ancestors colonized this land and enacted violence upon the people who are the natural and traditional stewards of this land, the, the Tongva and the Chumash people, specifically in the area where I come from. And so the question is, how do, do people who come from colonizer traditions um, redevelop and reestablish a relationship with the land? Because yeah. You know, I, I'm probably not going to go back to live in the northern lands of my, you know, ancestral lineage. Like, I'm probably, I lived in England for a while. I've lived in, you know, Scandinavia for a while. But, you know, I'm American. So yeah. I, I, I feel like what we're being called to do is really wrestle with this idea and create new traditions, which means that we really have to educate ourselves and we have to create relationships that are honoring and respectful of the indigenous traditions of the lands on which we live <clears throat> and, <laughs> excuse me, and do the work of figuring out what this new practice means. And like you, I also, you know, I came from traditions that absolutely culturally appropriate. I mean, reclaiming definitely culturally appropriates because it's, you know, we grew up in a white supremacist colonialist culture and we can't escape that we did that, you know, yeah. and how it informed our mind. But so we are obligated <laughs> to do the work of figuring out what it means to not do that. And that's not going to be an easy task. But I think ultimately it's a very beautiful, pleasurable and empowering one that will that will create the kind of world that we want to live in. Yes, it's about I feel it's about educating ourselves and respecting and just asking the questions before engaging, essentially, and therefore creating new paths, as you're saying. OK, so shifting gears a little bit about the purpose, the collective purpose of witches. Do witches have a collective purpose or do different types of witches have a collective purpose? Where, where do you stand on this? Well, so again, as you were mentioning before, you know, there, there are many different kinds of witches. We don't all have a collective purpose that we all agree on. There are absolutely um, strong differences of opinion within the witchcraft community. Um, not all witches believe in a goddess or even a, a, the idea that the divine exists. Um, truly really the idea of something being divine, I think, is troubling because it sets the divine aside from ordinary life. And I think most witches believe in an imminent rather than a transcendent deity, meaning that spirit, that magic, that the divine comes through the material world, through the earth. It's not something that's coming down from a cloud or exists in this other realm. It's here, it's with us now. And, and so I think 
you know, the common collective purpose, as I said, or I would like to think that the common collective purpose of witchcraft is in, in standing up for the spirit of nature, standing up for and stewarding this planet and, and bringing all we have to that to really protect and defend her and do what we have to do to make sure that all beings on this planet thrive as they should, as is our birthright. Because we've abused the earth, we've claimed the earth, we've just... I remember my geography teacher used to tell me, George, it's not about saving planet Earth, it's about saving the human race, because the Earth <laughs> will just completely kick us out of the game uh, if we keep abusing her. So yes, it's all about um, respecting her and just helping her thrive so she can help us thrive as well. Okay, let's talk about dismantling patriarchy. Let's because that is a big topic around spirituality in general, but specifically around witches, because we all know about the witch huntings in the past. And whenever I talk with light workers or witches or spiritual seekers, they, many of them have these, these remembrance, these memories of their past lives where they've been burned at the stake or they've been, they've been persecuted for working their magic and owning their beliefs. How do we start dismantling patriarchy? What can we do? What, can, what are some action steps that people listening right now can take to start contributing towards it? Yeah, so great question. I mean, there's two parts to this. First of all, there's internal work that needs to be done. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a witch, we might call that exorcisms, right? So many of us, you know, we've all, essentially we've all grown up under the system of patriarchy and we've all internalized that and uphold it to a certain degree because we're blind to the ways in which yeah. it affects and so we need to cast that out from within ourselves, which requires internal work of various kinds, whether it be ritual or therapy or body work or educating ourselves, reading widely. You know, there's a lot of work to be done inside. But then also, you know, dismantling patriarchy, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, because they're all interrelated with one another, requires systemic change, right? So it's not just something we do inside of ourselves, but it's something that we work collectively with other people to do and change the larger systems, such as the military industrial complex, such as getting rid of the police, such as dismantling um, oligarchic powers of, of oppression within the state. So, you know, that, that work maybe is not um, as sexy as sitting at your altar and lighting candles, but it's, it's absolutely as required. Like we need to be making those phone calls. We need to be on the protest lines. We need to be working together. So, I also think it's important to educate ourselves on the philosophies and practice of people who do not come from white supremacist, colonialist, patriarchal cultures. So for instance, we collectively on this earth have been brutally robbed of the immense wisdom, for instance, of um, indigenous cultures and philosophies, which have a completely different relationship to nature, to sexuality, to spirituality, um, to power and authority. And, you know, essentially the, the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy has tried to eradicate those other visions from the earth. And we all need to go and learn about them from people who are part of those cultures and, and learn that there are other alternative ways of being. And then we have to come back and revise our own culture and develop, redevelop these practices within ourselves, which again goes back to this idea of re-enchantment, because that's what re-enchantment is, is holding the world as sacred. Because what is sacred can't be destroyed, it can't be exploited. If black lives are sacred, if water is sacred, if children are sacred, if you are sacred, if the mountains are sacred, then we cannot be exploited, we cannot destroy them, we cannot treat them with dishonor. And so um, basically, the, the practice is about looking for ways to honor what is sacred in our life by all means necessary. <laughs> oh my goodness, I so love this message because it's so aligned with, uh, with my book, Lightwork Has Gotta Work. Like, it's not all about meditating and doing the spiritual work. It's 
getting that light that you've nurtured in your meditation practice and then getting into the real world <laughs> and doing something about it because so much of spirituality has become, oh, I'm shifting my vibration, therefore I'm shifting the vibration of the world. Well, you're shifting the vibration of your room and a little bit of the world. <laughs> but unless you take physical action, you can't change this physical world. So thank you for bringing this up. Now, well, yes. Well, Exactly as you're saying, like the reason that we do meditation is so that we, yes. we don't lose our, our mind and so that we can come back and then go and do the work in the world, right? Like we're doing it so that we can do that work in exactly. the world. Exactly, exactly. Rather than just spiritually bypassing and just ignoring the physical work and just, just meditating. Because in meditation, in spiritual work, in like spells, we receive guidance. And then we t unless we take that guidance and express it in physical form, then we're, not, we're doing a disservice to the guidance and to our own meditation and practice or spiritual work practice. Well, you know what's interesting about that is that in the tarot, the priestess card, the high priestess card, which is uh, Major Arcana 2, is paired with the justice card that's they're in they're in constant constellation with one another so yes as a high priestess you receive the messages from spirit and you do the meditations and you present the offerings but if you're not doing it in the name of justice then you're not doing what needs to be done they're 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 in relationship with one another we I have to take it. action in the world for justice i love it i didn't know this analogy with the tarot but it's perfect actually I love how it's like all these messages are subtly embedded into like spiritual tools. Okay, so a lot of work and a lot of talk in the spiritual community and in the witchcraft community is all about the rise of the divine feminine, which of course, it's been persecuted for so long. It's rising. We still have a lot more work to do it. However, sometimes I feel that people are bashing the masculine while helping the feminine rise rather than using the masculine as a tool to help the feminine rise. So the question is, what role does a divine masculine energy play in bringing upon this balanced world, this reclaiming and re-enchantment of nature that we're talking about? Well, this is a really in interesting question because it has a, a two-part kind of contradictory answer. First of all, I think that the, the terminology, divine feminine, divine masculine, I feel like we've reached the end of its usefulness. Mm -hmm. I feel like the language of the feminine and the masculine and what those are, you know, that was developed by patriarchy. And as Audre Lorde says, we can't use the master's tools to, de to demolish the ma master's house. So the idea that a feminine thing is this coherent thing and that a masculine energy is a coherent thing, I feel like is not really honoring the complexity of, of what and who we are. And we really need to move beyond the binary into a space of complexity and a place of shape shifting and yes and if we're gonna have any hope at all of re-enchanting the world. And the idea of feminine and masculine as fixed points always implies a hierarchy. So masculine equals good, feminine equals bad, light equals good, dark equals bad. I, th I think all of that is really problematic and, and not really useful anymore. However, I don't know what other language we should use. I'm trying to find other language, but you know, I speak English and that, and even if I were to speak, you know, any other romance language that I might've studied in high school or something, it's, it's true in all of those languages. So I don't know exactly how to move beyond that. But my second point is, yes, the divine masculine, especially within spiritual circles, does get bashed. But I also think, you know, the divine masculine is the responsibility of men and masculine identifying people to re-envision. So you mm. tell me what, what the divine masculine needs to do now. I love that. So... From my perspective, and this is something I play with these terms in my book, Lightwork Has Gotta Work, I, I, I talk about, I define the divine masculine as um, divinely guided action, and then the divine feminine as nurturing your light. But where I end up in my pondering and analyzing of these terms is that essentially, it's, it's what you said as your, with your first point, 
the divine masculine and the divine feminine are two sides of the same coin because when you're truly in your feminine energy and you're doing the meditation work and the spiritual work and you're receiving all these guidance, you're naturally inspired to act on that guidance and therefore go into the action which could be the masculine. At the same time, when you're authentically in your divine masculine energy and therefore you're taking action, it's not hassle and it's not ego work, as I call it. It's inspired action and therefore it is backed up by divine feminine. So divine feminine is divine masculine and divine masculine is divine feminine. It's just the two uh, polar opposites that we created in this patriarchal world to just confuse ourselves and create like opposing wars and just arguments with one another. But essentially, when we come into this meditation of stillness and connecting with our authentic self and align ourselves with who we really are, we feel this balance. And this balance is so obvious out in nature. Nature doesn't need to define it in divine masculine or divine feminine. It just bees it. But because we're humans and we like compartmentalizing things, we like to put on those labels. But essentially, my point is, when we come into stillness and into our alignment, we found this balance already. And we are acting on our feminine and we're acting on our masculine and all is well. So essentially, my answer is, how do we embrace our divine masculine? We go out in nature and we let her show us a way. Absolutely. I mean, when we think of nature, like, is a tree feminine or, feminine or masculine? Is a forest? Is a mountain? Is the planet? I mean, is the ocean? Often we think of the ocean as feminine, but there are lots of yeah. uh, male deities. How about Poseidon? He's fierce. Right. He's the earth shaker. Yeah, so I think, um, I think that the idea of feminine and masculine are not that helpful because, you know, there is great power and rage and action in feminine forces. You yes. know, a, 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 a lioness yes. is hardly like a retiring, receiving, nurturing being all the time. And so I... I I wonder if there's a way that we could start using different language around this when we're speaking of active or we're speaking of receptive. Um, maybe it's not so much about uh, gender as it is about ways of, of being in the world. And it, it might be time to look to the poets to help us expand our, our language around that. And get more fluid in our, in our way of understanding these, this yeah. interplay of these energies. Oh my goodness, Amanda, I loved having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Please let us know where can people get in touch with you and where can people get the book? Okay, so the book Initiated Memoir of a Witch is available wherever books are sold. Um, you know, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it on indie bookstores, you can get it at your local bookstore. It's been translated into a bunch of different languages now. So if you're, if you're, if you're listening from a different country, you might be able to get uh, a translation. Uh, you can also find that on my website, uh, oracleoflosangeles.com. You can follow me on Instagram at Oracle of LA or on Facebook at Oracle of LA as well. And please do tune into my podcast, Between the Worlds. You can find it on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to our podcast, your podcast. Um, we talk about tarot, we talk about witchcraft, we talk about spirituality and philosophy, and we hope you join us. And of course, so all the links. Work. Yes, thank you so much for being here. And of course, all the links will be in the show notes for everybody to access. Wishing you a lovely rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure.